Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. This is the Fast Friday edition of the show for February 26th, 2021. And on this episode, I've got a short highlight reel of an important but forgotten founder, Robert R. Livingston, who passed away today in history, February 26th, 1813. If you were alive in the early days of the Republic, you absolutely knew his name or his nickname, even though most people today have never even heard of him. So I've got some great info about his life, some of his uh, important events and involvement, for example, in the Declaration of Independence, some of the major roles he played after, and his influence on the ratification of the Constitution in New York. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow this program, all the archives, uh, links and references on individual episodes so you can read and learn more on your own time, all the different platforms, the mainstream ones, live streaming video, and then we have archive uh, video versions on a bunch of other platforms in case you notice that we happen to be missing somewhere at some point. And then of course we have the audio only podcast edition all over the place and our membership program, where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month, and we make it go a long, long way in support of the Constitution and liberty. That show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And look, I couldn't be more grateful for you spending some of your time with me today. Thank you so much for being here. Whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one, thank you. I can't say that enough. But since it's Fast Friday, I promise to not take up too much of your time today. Let's see if I can get through this info in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And I want to start out with a short blog, an intro to a short blog that we ran by Dave Benner, who does so much awesome work on interesting historical events. We published this a couple of years ago. And of course, I will link to it in the show notes over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Here's how Dave kicks it off. Today in history, February 26th, 1813, Robert Livingston died. Known as the chancellor for his position at the top of New York's equity court, he became one of his state's most influential politicians in an era of political upheaval. He was also an important figure in the ratification of the Constitution. And it's interesting to note, he came from a very wealthy family. So early on, you know, he got a pretty important job. He was, uh, one of his first jobs was working for the government as recorder of the city of New York in 1773. And here from msu.edu, I have an interesting project with a bunch of uh, historical information on Livingston and others, but they say it was easy to see that Livingston was destined for a life of res revolutionary greatness. Why? because he got fired from that job. And why? Because he asserted his position in the favor of the American people, the patriots, instead of the British authority who he worked under the purview of. So this is cancel culture right off the bat. Of course, the establishment didn't like that. He was taking the side of his people, his neighbors, his countrymen, his, uh, and instead they just got rid of him. Didn't matter whether he was good or bad at it. But going forward, one of the most important things that he was involved in, in my opinion, was on June 11th, 1776. He was appointed to a committee and this is from Wikipedia, a committee of the Second Continental Congress. Those of you who have studied the history, you know where I'm going with this. This committee was known as the Committee of Five, which was given the task of drafting the Declaration of Independence. We know Jefferson was on that, Benjamin Franklin and others. So it wasn't, Jefferson was the primary draftsman, but these other figures like Livingston were very influential on its text. But before uh, Livingston could actually sign the final version of the declaration, he was recalled by New York. They pulled him home. However, even because he was so on board with it, he sent his cousin, Philip Livingston, to sign the document in his place. And another cousin of his, William Livingston, would eventually go on to sign the United States Constitution. After that, 
actually, he was really influential in uh, the drafting and ratification of the New York State Constitution in 1777. He did a lot of work on this with John Jay, who was a great longtime friend of his. Jay ended up being the first chief justice of the Supreme Court, nominated by George Washington. Jay was also one of the three authors of the Federalist Papers, although he didn't do nearly as much work on that as Hamilton and Madison. But he met Jay sometime around 1770 or so, right after he got out of college, and they became very much long time friends and colleagues. So they worked together in this drafting and ratification of the New York State Constitution. And here from MSU, they say, what made this situation unique was not only the fight for American independence that was happening simultaneously, but also the New York Constitution of 77 was a declaration of independence within itself. So here's a guy that was part of the Committee of Five. He sent his cousin to sign in his place the Declaration, and then they were drafting their own constitution, and they were declaring their own independence within that independence movement. Going further, they say, replacing that colonial charter that existed before, the New York Constitution of 1777 established, and this may sound familiar, a bicameral legislature containing an assembly and a senate as well as an executive branch held by the governor of the state. It was an interesting precursor to what led to be the Constitution for the United States. And because of that work, he got a lot of recognition. And as a result of the New York Constitution of 77, Livingston begins another highly coveted position as the Chancellor of New York in 1777. The Chancellor, MSU puts it, is the highest ranking judicial officer in the state, as the chancellor was required to be a lawyer and appointed to the position. And it's significant because he was the first chancellor in New York history. And prior to that, it was the colonial governor. Uh, someone who worked for the king was the governor and the chancellor at the same time. So this was a big step in the direction of independence for New York State, which was kind of leading the way on this around the country and a glimpse of the new American political system at work. And I think that's an interesting way to put it. Livingston ended up holding this position as chancellor from 1777 all the way to 1801, a really, really long time, especially in those days. And because of that, he is forever known as the chancellor. In fact, even if you read the debates in the New York ratifying convention, sometimes they put him, they list him as the Honorable Robert R. Livingston, sometimes the Honorable Livingston, sometimes he's just listed as the chancellor. A lot of people just called him the chancellor. And you don't get a nickname like that unless you're really, really highly respected. He was also ended up being the first secretary of state for the entire country. Uh, actually, it wasn't called that. I think it was um, secretary of foreign affairs. This was from 1781 to 1783. This was under the Articles of Confederation. So the first secretary of state for the country. After that, going further, he be was very influential in the New York ratifying convention, uh, considering whether they were going to approve the Constitution for the United States. There was a big debate in New York, New York, Massachusetts, Virginia, and elsewhere. There was a lot of uncertainty of whether or not this was going to pass. The debate there started, or the convention started on June 17th, 1788. They just went through some kind of procedural things on the 17th and 18th. And then on the 19th, people were able to start debate and speeches. He was the first one. So they just, they read the constitution. Okay, here's what we're gonna talk about. And then it went to the Honorable Robert R. Livingston to talk about it. And early on, he ended up talking about the differences between the old world and what they were trying to establish or what they had already created in the new world. And he said differences among them, this was on the 19th, the first speech in the New York ratifying convention, differences among them, therefore over there in the old world will continue to be decided by sword. And the blood of thousands will be shed before the most trifling controversy can be determined. There was always a concern about wars in the old world and they wanted to avoid that type of a situation in the United States like so many others. He said, even peace can hardly be said to bestow her usual blessings on them. So even when they're at peace, they still had what they called mutual jealousies. They're always concerned about something bad happen. And at best, it was an armed truce, he says. He says, the husbandmen feel the oppression of standing armies. And like so many others, whether it was Samuel Adams or Elbridge Jerry, 
James Madison and many others, he recognized the danger of standing armies. He didn't have to go into any detail, but he just literally pointed out. He said that you would feel the oppression of the standing armies by whom the fruits of his labor are devoured. We know taxation is theft and they had to steal uh, through taxation in order to pay for those standing armies. And on that first day, he gave this long speech and said, we really need to consider this line by line. I know some of you already have your minds made up, but let's go through this entire constitution and have a debate. Whether you agree with me on one thing or another or not, let's get this out there. And I think he recognized, for example, and this is just my own guess. I'm just reading into this. I think he recognized what happened in Pennsylvania the previous year, where they basically just slammed the, the ratification through and they silenced the opponents, the anti-federalists. They wouldn't even allow their views to get published in papers. They would get shut down if they tried to publish things. And I think he recognized that was a serious problem in a state where it was gonna be a very close vote one way or the other. And he wanted to make sure that they did not make that same error because the solution to speech and opinions you don't like is more speech. I guess that's my own interpretation of how Livingston addressed this. He went on, here's another interesting quote. He said, the, they acknowledge the people here, so over there they have wars and oppression and taxation, but here the people acknowledge the same great principle of government, a principle if not unknown, at least little understood in the old world that all power is derived from the people. And I've talked about the evolution of sovereignty in American political thought from the early days in the 1760s through the revolution and beyond. Sovereignty as final authority was always in the hands of a king or a queen or a small group of people. And now it was going to be the people of the several states. And he sounded like a tenther here as well before the 10th amendment was even considered. They consider the state and the general governments as de different deposits of that power. Back to Benner, Livingston assured the assembly that the con constitutional model was a republic formed by a league of states. He also countered the attacks regarding the power of the executive by claiming, clarifying that almost all powers resided in Congress, not the executive branch, including the power of war, peace, and taxation. He was interestingly enough talking about, well, I'll get to that in a moment. He said this, the Senate, this was on June 20th, the Senate are indeed designed to represent the state governments. He really was into a federal model and recognized that was the best way to preserve liberty. And he was even against term limits. And I'm, I should actually do an episode on the founder's view on term limits, some were for, some were against. Livingston was very strongly against, and here's how he put it. The people are the best judges who ought to represent them to dictate and control them, basically by saying you have to rotate, you can't choose this person, to tell them who they shall not elect is to abridge their natural rights. And this one I thought is cool, and I covered this last, uh, yeah, sometime in the last couple of months, I think it was last November, on April 30th, 1789, for those of you watching, you can see the image here. This was uh, George Washington taking his oath of office, April 30th, 1789, and that oath of office was administered by the Chancellor Robert R. Livingston, and then everyone after that was from the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Back to Benner, he says, breaking with the Federalists, and this was interesting because he was a supporter of the Constitution, he was uh, with George Washington and others, but he wasn't consistently, he wasn't like a mindless partisan. He was willing to break with them, even on issues that basically got him kind of uh, unliked in certain quarters. So breaking with the Federalists in the 1790s, he opposed the National Bank, the Jay Treaty, the Sedition Act, and the Quasi War. And he eventually, once Jefferson got into office in 1801, he was appointed to serve as an ambassador to France. Dave writes that Livingston was instrumental in negotiating the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. We don't have to like everything he did, of course. And upon the occasion, he declared, quote, the United States take rank this day among the first powers of the world. Now, he retired from politics shortly after that, and with his friend who he met in France, Robert Fulton, in 1807, I just thought this was an interesting way to close out, he built the first commercially successful steamboat. I've got a link to a replica of it here uh, from Wikipedia. I will link to that in the show notes over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path 
to liberty. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was fun to watch or listen to. I hope it was educational. I hope you enjoyed this information as much as I enjoyed putting it together and sharing it with you. If you like this show, you like this work, you like this kind of info, you like this episode, you love the TAC, whatever it may be, please help us spread the word by doing a few easy peasy free things like smashing the like button, leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform that you're able to, comments primarily in the archive, and links to of the mainstream platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and elsewhere. Any of those things, all those actions, they tell the algorithm of the platform you watch or listen on to show the program to more people. It's a very easily triggered algorithm, and your help helps me get the word out to more people. And of course, if you want to put your financial faith behind a work, that membership program for as little as two bucks a month might be the most affordable one out there. We try to make it easy to sign up over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Don't feel any obligation, but if you can actually spare that couple of dollars a month or more, I would be very grateful to any consideration you can give to that today. Of course, I really appreciate you spending some of your time with me today. I hope you have a great weekend. I appreciate you uh, listening to this episode or watching it, and I'll see you next week here on the Path to Liberty.